Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. For those of you who wonder why the channel is called the Mighty Gloostick, it actually started off as a crafting channel, so I literally did use glue sticks all the time, but it's uh, transitioned into talking about monsters full time, which I'm more than happy with. Next in our lineup of monsters from the core monster manual for 5th edition and it just so happens another elemental creature to add to our elemental series are the gargoyles. These creatures are icons of fantasy, they grace thousands of magnificent works of significant architecture around the world through the ages. There is loads of symbolism in their forms and placements. Some are quite shockingly irreverent, some are satirical, and all of them have a vaguely menacing air about them. In Dungeons and Dragons they have been part of the game from the very beginning. They, these are basic classic monsters in their general appearance and behaviour, but they have been in a state of constant change throughout the editions of the game which made researching them for this video quite a challenge. When I started reading the entries for their lore, I was a bit worried that this was going to be... I wasn't going to be able to present any sort of ecology for them, but I'm happy to say that the current version for the latest edition is actually the best. I think they've really makes them a lot more sense, as we shall see. First though, let's dive and delve into the past and look at the changes that have taken place over time. When they first appeared in the game way back in 1974, they were described as winged reptilian bipeds. Shortly after, in the Lost Caverns of Sojanth, we encounter a more horrid version without wings called the Margoyle. The Margoyle often led a group of smaller, weaker gargoyles and lived exclusively underground, with a thicker hide that appears even more rocky and makes them very difficult to detect when they're not moving. There is also some aquatic winged gargoyles called the Capoes, Capoa Synth, which first appeared in Dave Arneson's Blackmore supplements for uh, Dungeons and Dragons in 1975, but they are also found in the world of Toril and in, in, in and around the Purple Rocks, which are a series of small islands in the trackless sea, an archipelago located west of uh, Gundalin. The Purple Rocks, along with Tjern, Gundalin and Ruatham, live uh, at the mercy of the far harsher sea, sea storms that those on the mainland uh, never see and have a winter spanning nearly eight months a year. Aside from the long ships of the Northmen ploughing through the roaring Arctic Sea and the towering icebergs below the waves, a thriving network of aquatic civilizations can be found, with a deep river of hot spring water providing a hotly contested environment for merfolk, sea elves, tritons, and inhabited by all manner of other sea creatures, including coral encrusted Galeb, Galeb Dur and aquatic gargoyles. The capoeisynths who cluster in deep ocean cliffs and chasms but also find purchase on the rocky, wave-pounded shores of the archipelago. Leaping from the water with wings good for swimming or flying, they ride the bitterly cold Oral's breath winds to snatch sailors from passing longboats. They're rarely found in great numbers elsewhere but could travel through the waters to nearly anywhere on Toril. The whole concept of what a gargoyle was then shifted away from a natural living creature to a being of animated stone sculpture, more advanced than a regular golem. Greyhawk brought us the Grist or True Gargoyle in the adventure called Vale of the Mage, printed in 1990. The Grist was created by Jason Cremere, the Exalted One, by taking a statue resembling a gargoyle and casting a wish, stone shape, polymorph, any object, fear, fly and quest spell. Gris are semi-intelligent and thus able to follow only the simplest of instructions, but they follow these instructions to the letter, just like all other sorts of golem. It is unknown how many Grists the mage created, but several dozen are believed to exist. Grimir termed his creation true gargoyles as they fit his vision of what a gargoyle should be. A Grist has been enchanted to give it a resistance to magic and an immunity to normal weapons. Its skin looks like the exterior of the stone building or rocky mountainside it attaches itself to, and its dense rock structure causes the Grist to weigh between one and three tons. Despite its weight, the magic that animates it also allows it to fly. The wings only provide an additional maneuverability. The Grist has the ability to actually bond with the stone structure or rocky terrain it lives on, becoming firmly anchored in place and adding to the deception that it's just a monstrous four-armed stone sculpture. They don't speak, they have nothing resembling lungs or vocal cords, they're just magically animated stone. So they're not elemental creatures, they don't even have thoughts, they just follow simple instructions and will fight until destroyed. The only difference between them and a flying golem is that they heal themselves by resting and absorbing minerals from the rock around them. So existing in or near mint condition, uh, mint condition for a very, very long time. 
they are created by um, casting wish and stone shape and polymorph and such so it's quite an involved process and they don't reproduce naturally obviously gradually the lore of gargoyles shifted toward them being a living elemental stone and this is largely thanks to the line of comics for forgotten realms produced by dc comics so the veracity of the lore from the comic books is conditional and i won't bog you down with the details of the otherworldly invasion of imgig zoo but i suspect that this is a reimagining of the gargoyles which has inspired the timely revision of the species into its current and i think much better form so what are they now is there a relationship between the Nabazu demons and the elemental gargoyles? Let's investigate that for a moment. The Nabazu is a major demon type, first appeared in the first edition Monster Manual 2 in 1983. The larval Nabazu appeared in third edition within the pages of Dungeon Magazine number 112 in 2004. The juvenile Nabazu and the mature Nabazu appeared in the Fiendish, Fiendish Codex 1 Hordes of the Abyss in 2006, which is a great book. These demons are very close to undead creatures but bear an unmistakable resemblance to gargoyles. During their larval and juvenile stage, they live on the prime material plane, later returning to the abyss, often in the service of Orcus. But demons are essentially a corruption of elemental matter. They result from an alien spirit from another multiverse infusing raw elemental substance and forming a body from it, in the same way that elementals do. Is there some relationship between the life cycle of the Nabazu demons and the creation of the gargoyles? Could some of them at some point have naturalized to the prime material or elemental planes and never gone on to become adult Nabazu. Just something to ponder. A possible avenue to take a planner adventure down. I know quite a few of you are fascinated with the idea of somehow reforming de uh, devils and demons. So there's something in that line of reasoning. Fifth edition gargoyles are elemental creatures. There is also a grist version found in Tomb of Annihilation. It says Serac has the knowledge of how to create those giant four-armed stoned guardians. But now this is accomplished by elemental magic rather than a wish spell. One thing that really leans my thinking towards a fiendish connection behind the gargoyle is that they're so malevolent towards living creatures. They delight in creating terror when they leap from hiding in plain sight and love to torment and torture victims, relishing the pain and suffering that they inflict. This is not normal behavior for an elemental being of earth. There is something very wrong with gargoyles. So in the monstrous manual, it, uh, in the monster manual, it tells us that gargoyles cling to rocky cliffs and mountainsides, or roost on ledges or in underground caves. They have little impact on the environment if they need no food or drink. They don't sleep and they don't breathe air. They haunt city rooftops, perching vulture-like among the high stone arches and buttresses of castles and cathedrals. They can hold themselves so still that they appear inanimate able to maintain the estate for years if need be. If magically coerced or bound by some compelling oath of service, a gargoyle can guard a location for a very long time. They have a well-deserved reputation for horrible cruelty. Statues carved into the likenesses of gargoyles appear in the architecture of countless cultures to frighten away trespassers. Although such sculptures are only decorative, real gargoyles can hide among them to amb ambush unsuspecting victims. A gargoyle might alleviate the tedium of watching it by catching and tormenting birds or rodents, leaving grisly piles or remains scattered around to decompose. But it's only... Uh, it's long wait only increases its craving for harming sentient creatures they provide the sport it desires the most they prefer minimum effort and maximum pain and carnage if tasked with guarding some valuable treasure or specific location that regularly provides witless interlopers or thieves for them to slowly murder they're fairly easily persuaded into service they sometimes serve demons for their propensity for wanton destruction and chaos powerful spellcasters can also easily enlist gargoyle guardians to help watch over their gates and Walls. The gargoyles have the patience and fortitude of stone and will serve even the cruelest masters for years without complaint unless they're actually really threatened with death. In combat, these creatures are tough and dangerous. They have an armor class of 15, between 28 and 77 hit points, with an average of 52. They can move at 30 feet on the ground, moving much like a gorilla on knuckles and feet, and fly at 60 feet per round. As elemental creatures, they're extremely durable. They're resistant to all forms of physical damage from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing weapons that are not magical or made from adamantine, uh, the uh, super strong metal. It may also suggest that uh, these weapons or creatures that have the siege weapon quality would also blast through the resistance of a gargoyle due to the overwhelming force of the attacks. They are, of course, totally immune to poison. Airless environments can operate just as well underwater and can exist in toxic gases, volcanic fumes, and in lakes of decomposing filth. They can also, uh, they're not, they can't be petrified and they never get tired. 
I would normally say that these creatures, which are immune to petrification, would make a nice combination with a basilisk or cockatrice or medusa, but the gargoyle prefers to torture living prey to death and would not appreciate their victims being turned to stone, unresponsive stone, before they can have their fun. But give them one, uh, give one of them a flesh to stone wand though, and things change completely. Gargoyles with such a handy tool may even put a leash on some young basilisks and lift them directly into a combat, uh, into a village, to basically airdrop them in order to have some fun on the victims, which they can turn back to uh, to flesh afterwards. Good lizard doggy. They speak their native Terran, not, uh, no mention of speaking abyssal or common for that matter, so it may be tricky negotiating with them. They have 60 foot dark vision and a reasonably passive uh, perception of 10, but they tend to never sleep, never tire, and greatly enjoy watching a certain area like a hawk 24-7. So they'll be actively searching for any trace of movement or any sound or tremor that indicates some creature is trying to sneak by or sneak up on them. So they are actively percepting all the time, not really passively percepting. They are fairly direct in combat, closing to melee range and enjoying the act of ripping apart living flesh and blood beings. They attack twice per round, with one with their bite and one with their claws, indicating that they're fairly slow, and they have a plus four to hit and, and do 1d6 plus two piercing damage on the bite and the same but slashing damage with their claws. The giant grist version is a large elemental, elemental it has an armor class of 17 and between 84 and 210 hit points with an average of 147. It is largely the same, has the same resistances and such, obviously much stronger and it's plus eight to hit and do, doing 2d6 plus four piercing damage with a bite and with its two extra arms it makes four claw attacks doing 2d4 plus four slashing damage with each hit. Uh, so it can take on multiple foes in a round or make quick work of a single um, opponent. Regular gargoyles make great encounters for low level characters. They are ideal residents of tombs, ruins and evil lairs of wizards, necromancers and the like. They serve an excellent role at higher level play as very tough mobs that can pose a significant threat with increased numbers particularly as they just shrug off so much melee damage. They don't have any protection from elemental damage though, so magic casters are very effective against them. When you need to include them at high level or need a template for an elemental beast, the giant gargoyle is great and they're very straightforward and can be adapted easily by adding and subtracting abilities to make whatever sort of elemental creature you need of great size. They are also handy in that these creatures are so very clearly evil. There is no questioning the fact that these are beings um, which are supernatural menaces from an alien dimension and they can be destroyed with impunity. There is no moral dilemma and very little chance of a peaceful resolution that avoids any sort of pain or suffering. These things want to be evil, they enjoy it. If they did read they would subscribe to Atrocity Weekly or Slaughterhouses Illustrated or some such. They are nasty creatures who are not compatible with goodness, peace and happiness. My recommendation is go kill them with fire and lots of it. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride. Check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.